I would like uh, to thank you all for uh, joining um, our webinar today. It's a special webinar because we will announce the winner of the first uh, eAccess Forum Research Prize with the theme uh, um, uh, Challenges Climate Change Poses on uh, um, Central Banking. Uh, but before the announcement, I would like to thank the members of the selection committee, namely Patrick Bolton, Fernanda Necchio, uh, Pierre Monat, uh, Lucrezia Reitling, Glenn Rudebusch, and of course the chair of the selection committee, um, Steve Cecchetti. We received many and excellent um, submissions, so I know the decision the selection committee had to make was not easy. But now I will pass the floor to Steve um, so that he can make the announcements. Steve? Thank you very much. Um, so um, just, it's my pleasure to, uh, to moderate today's webinar. Um, it's in two parts. Uh, the first is, uh, as uh, Anastasia suggested, is the is the EAXIS prize announcement, and then we'll turn to a discussion of research on climate change mitigation policies. So to start, um, I want to introduce the winner, and the winner is uh, Filippo Nardoli. Uh, Filippo is an economist at the uh, International Economics Directorate of the, Bank, uh, of the Bank of Italy, and his research interests are at the intersection of macroeconomics and finance, um, with a focus on monetary and fiscal policy and on the economic implications of, uh, of climate change. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to, to Filippo. So congratulations and thank you very much. And, um, and he will give us a brief summary of his paper and then we'll turn to the panel. Filippo, it's all yours. Thank you well, very much, before, Steve. Okay. Filippo, before you start, I just wanted to show you, you know, your prize, if you can see it. Uh, we're giving it to you virtually this year, which means I will promptly send it to you. But the hope is that for next year's prize, we can um, do this in person. So go ahead. Thank you very much, Anastasia and Steven. It's, it's a great honor for me to, to receive this prize from such distinguished committee. So I'll show you um, three slides just to, to present briefly my research. If I can share my screen. Um, okay, um, so maybe you have, okay. Um, all right. Okay, C can you see my screen? Um, full screen. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, so, <clears throat> so briefly in this paper, uh, I aim at quantifying the macroeconomic effects of temperature shocks on the US economy. And the motivation of my research is that there is a longstanding, uh, um, longstanding literature exploring the nexus between the weather and the economy, uh, also from the empirical side, but mostly to have insights on the long run effects of temperatures. So um, many papers have investigated in a multi-country settings, the effects of an increase in average temperature on the, on the per capita growth rate of GDP at country level. <clears throat> but this has a global perspective and the propagation along the business cycle actually is something that is still mostly unknown from an empirical point of view. And this is an important question because it can have some implication for policies that counteract uh, business cycle fluctuation. I'm, I'm referring notably to monetary policy. Uh, as temperatures are, are increasingly hot and volatile, this research question is quite challenging because one needs to identify some unanticip unanticipated variation in temperature that can be used as exogenous shock in, uh, in an empirical setting. So in this paper, what I do, I propose a new way to construct some a series of quarterly unexpected temperature shocks at country level, starting from daily temperatures. And I propose an application to the US economy that is based on county level data from the 1970 to 2019. And I construct my shock at quarterly frequency, and then I plug my shock into a local projection framework to estimate the macro effects on the US economy. 
Let's go briefly to the, the identification. So uh, let's have a look at this picture. In this picture, I plotted the distribution of daily average temperatures in, in one quarter, let's say 2022 Q3, in one single county. The blue line represents the realized temperatures that I experienced in that quarter, and the red line represents the distribution of expected temperature that you have uh, one day before the, the quarter starts for that quarter. And the, the expectation of temperature are based on the temperature that have been experienced in the same quarter in the last five years. And <clears throat> the, the difference between these two curves uh, are telling you something. So uh, in this example, what I'm showing is that uh, if the tails of the realized temperature distribution are thicker, than expected, it means that there are more extremes in, uh, in the realized distribution than in the recent past. And it turns out to be a bad surprise for the economy. Why that? Because the um, temperature are known to have nonlinear effects, both on human health and on the economy, where the extremes uh, uh, tail temperature realization are the ones that uh, are detrimental for, for uh, humans and for the economy. So I, I do this computation for each single county and for each single quarter. At a county level, I count the number of excess days in the left tail and in the right tail, and I construct my surprise. And then I aggregate this surprise by weighting them by the exposure of each county to, um, to temperatures. And I choose population as population can be one of the measure that proxy the exposure and the vulnerability of the counties and get the, uh, a US-wide shock at quarterly frequency. In this picture, I'm showing you the impulse response function obtained using local projection when I plug my shock on the right-hand side and I <clears throat> compute the response following a one standard deviation temperature shock that is more or less equal to an increase of four excess days in a single quarter. And what you can see from this picture is that uh, there is a, a negative impact response on real GDP. And while the, shocks, while the shock is temporary, actually the response uh, is quite persistent uh, and it persists through between one and two years after the shock. So this effect comes from a slowdown in both consumption and investment, uh, while the response of investment is stronger and within the re real consumption, also the, the response of durable consumption is stronger and this suggest that there can be an increasing attention uh, <clears throat> about the future risk related to climate change that can shape some behavior of households and firms uh, in, the present, in the present quarter, so at the impact of the shock. So looking at the second line, you can see that the response of the consumer price index is also negative, and this suggests that uh, some demand-driven channel can prevail over supply-side channels. There are both types of channels that can have a role regarding temperature, but in this case, this response suggests that there are demand-driven channels that are driving the response. And this, and the response, the response of the short and long-term interest rates that decrease after four to eight quarter also suggests that monetary policy does react to the deteriorating environment by stimulating the economy uh, and cutting interest rate. So this is briefly my paper, and I, I'll give back the floor to Steve to, to go ahead with the presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. And for those of you, for those of you that are interested, um, excuse me, Filippo gave a longer uh, webinar for the eAccess Forum uh, uh, last year, or no, a few, when I don't recall actually when it was, but that it, there's a link in the, uh, in the chat that, uh, to that, and um, and if anybody wants it, we can certainly uh, we can certainly provide that. So thank you very much. This is I just want to emphasize that this is the type of research that we find I think we found really really interesting um, from a policy perspective because it provides a link between uh, between climate events and things that are important for things like monetary policy on the right time frame the a lot of a lot of what people are concerned about with climate is takes a lot longer to play out and isn't in that time frame um, but not everything and i think that we need to work uh, work harder on uh, 
on ensuring that we understand how it is that climate's affecting every uh, aspect of the economy. So with that, let me turn to the panel. Um, I'm extremely pleased uh, to, uh, to be able to introduce uh, the panelists. Um, I just received a note from Patrick Bolton that he's had something unexpected happened, um, and he will try to join us a, a bit later. Um, the uh, other panelists who were not able to be here are Fernanda Necchio and uh, Lucrezia Reichlin, um, who also have, uh, have other obligations that prevent them from being here. But let me, um, let me start. I'll introduce uh, Glenn Rudebusch. Um, I'll introduce Anastasia, who didn't introduce herself, really, and, uh, and Pierre uh, Monin, and, um, and then we'll, we'll, go, we'll go from there. So Glenn is a non-resident uh, senior fellow at Brookings with the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy, and he's also a senior fellow at the NYU Volatility and Risk Institute um, of the Stern School of Business. Um, I've known Glenn for many, many years um, and always think of him as one of the top researchers at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, where, uh, where he was the uh, research director for a while um, and also a senior policy advisor. Um, he's published widely in macroeconomic forecasting uh, and, uh, and monetary policy strategy. But in recent years, he's, uh, he started to work on the economics of climate change and the associated financial risks. And, um, and I'll just point to one, I think, incredibly important uh, social good, which was to uh, establish the virtual seminar on climate economics. Uh, uh, Anastasia Pappas is the is the founder, CEO, and the chair of the board of EAXIS Forum, which uh, is the sponsor of the prize and of this uh, and of this webinar. And it's a nonpartisan uh, research organization on macroeconomics and sustainability. Um, I was drawn to the uh, to participating with the forum because of its um, desire to uh, to figure out how to spur research in. Uh, that at the boundaries of climate and uh, and macroeconomics and monetary and fiscal policy, um, the forum was founded in uh, in March of 2021. Um, Pierre is a senior fellow with the uh, Council on Economic Policies in uh, in Zurich, um, where he focuses on environmental and social effects of monetary policy. Uh, prior to that, he was uh, on uh, he worked at the Swiss National Bank. Um, and uh, uh, helping the board of members of that Swiss National Bank on issues associated with financial markets and monetary policy, um, as well as developing measures of financial stability, uh, things that are very, very interesting to me. Pierre also serves on the board of directors uh, of the EAXIS Forum as the secretary. Um, so the idea that we have is that we will discuss um, research both going forwards and going back. And, um, and I propose that, uh, that Filippo actually uh, goes first, um, since he is our prize winner and is closest uh, to the ground on all of the research. And, uh, and then we'll turn to Glenn, Anastasia, and Pierre. And if there are things that I have on my mind that didn't come up, I will add them at the end. So, um, Filippo, why don't you uh, tell us what you find the most exciting things in uh, in research on climate and macroeconomics in the last year or so, looking back, and where you think the biggest unanswered questions are going forward. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, yeah, I'm, I can kick off the question, the, um, the discussion. Uh, when when talking about climate mitigation policies, what comes first into my mind actually is the role of climatic policies. So government policies to actually directly counteract and mitigate climate change. So the, the discussion is, uh, um, has been related to many different policies that have been enacted in the past, must, must, uh, but the actual discussion is focused on uh, carbon tax and the cap and trade systems like the ETS one in Europe actually. There are two, um, different tools. One is fiscal policy, is a, actually is a tax that sets the aims at setting the carbon price, while the, uh, the, car, the cap and trade system is a, is a regulation that aims at setting some cap 
to the, to the total emission and the, the carbon price will be determined in equilibrium in this kind of setting. <clears throat> So um, the fact that actually um, in one case, the carbon price in determining equilibrium creates can create some uncertainty relied, related to future carbon prices. And this can be something that can um, shape current decision of firms in related to the transition. So these two systems are not as exactly equivalent. And what are the main question related to this thing is how these policies are effective in, uh, in, in cutting carbon emission. Actually, there is some recent research that has analyzed um, the implementation of this policy in the past, and it's, it, it, it tends to be that they have been efficient. But the other question that also deserves more, uh, more research is related to the, to the implication of these policies with other policies and with the economy in general. So for example, how carbon tax uh, um, um, <clears throat> interfere with other, uh, for example, capital income taxes, or whether uh, this, uh, um, this fiscal policy uh, climatic instrument can have also uh, effects on the distribution of wealth and income. These are questions that are still on the table and that, that carries um, these are more research. This is one point. The other point is that, um, uh, mitigation policy are not just something that governments can do. So governments are there to stimulate a transition that must come from households and firms. From the firm point of view, there's the energy sector that is in charge to decarbonize actually the, the energy production, but there is not just there the issue. There is also the industry that mm, must uh, <clears throat> take up this uh, decarbonization challenge and decarbonize their own industrial process. And, and I Personally, I think that the way things uh, each industry uh, is actually doing to uh, what the, this each industry is doing to decarbonize their own production process is something that is still not really understood from a research point of view. And this is also an issue for, for investors that must uh, identify the firms that are more engaged in the low carbon transition. So this is something that deserves more analysis. And from the household side, also time uh, has been spent to understand how households can adapt to climate change. Um, still research must be done on this uh, uh, to understand whether actually uh, households are saving more uh, when, they, uh, when the attention on climate change, on the future risk related to climate change is raised. But also there is another aspect uh, that is how households can themselves mitigate climate change. So they can, for example, save energy or consume responsibly. And this part of research um, must, be, uh, must, be, uh, must be done a little bit more because I, I, I didn't see so much regarding the, the active role of households in the mitigation process. So this is my briefly my take. And I want to leave thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That's really, that's really great. Um, Glenn? Congratulations to Fabio for his excellent research paper and this award. I want to thank uh, Anastasia and eAccess as well. They've done an incredible job of, of promoting climate economics uh, generally and the interface between policy and climate economics. And of course, thanks to Steve uh, for organizing this award, running a, running a tight ship uh, virtually uh, across the world. Um, I'm going to give a little broader uh, discussion, I think, that's that's uh, probably more my style. Um, but let me just respond to something that Fabio said in terms of climate mitigation policy. Um, and And I think for economists, we've got to be careful about focusing too much on on carbon taxes and uh, cap and trade systems. Um, and they're the obvious, they're the obvious solution for carbon externalities. Um, but in the U.S. especially, uh, and maybe this is a U.S. perspective on carbon taxes, it's been a, it's been a, uh, a hard uphill uh, battle, and, and we're still, uh, we're still uh, very far from reaching the, uh, the place we should be on carbon taxes. Um, but there's also uh, an innovation policy that I think is helpful. And we saw that in the Inflation Reduction Act, 
um, which which also can uh, go some way um, uh, towards the carbon externality, but also the innovation and R and D externality. Um, and uh, so, this more research on low carbon technology innovation, I think, can uh, really go a long way. And, and we've seen incredible uh, um, progress over the last decade in solar and, and elsewhere. Um, and I guess there's a announcement on nuclear fusion tomorrow, but we can't get our hopes up on that. Um, anyway, let me just uh, uh, put in a plug for thinking about for research uh, for further work on on uh, this innovation uh, policy. Um, I guess more over the past decade, my, my view is that in spite of much professional inertia, uh, economics research on climate change has slowly gained some traction, but there's, there's still more to do. Um, and the, the, the starting point is really to stress the, the broad scope of climate change, which will affect all aspects of, of human society. And thus, climate change is relevant for macroeconomics, microeconomics, finance, international labor development, and all the other sub-disciplines in economics. So um, my sense is that that uh, uh, all of those journals, all of those sub-disciplines should be uh, thinking about uh, issues in climate and research in climate. I'm going to focus, given my background, I'm focused sort of on, on finance and macro and the interface between them. Um, to think about uh, future research, future research topics um, regarding finance, financial markets and financial institutions are important tools for addressing climate change and understanding, researching how they can prepare for and mitigate uh, climate change uh, is a, is a key key topic. Um, financial one of the, one of the things the financial sector does is to allocate funds, and so a question is. Um, uh, how will the financial sector supply the investment capital and financing required to support decarbonization, uh, to uh, promote climate change mitigation and climate adaptation as well, which will also require funds. For example, what is the role of green bonds and ESG criteria? Um, <clears throat> since Patrick's not here, I'll mention the you know the the risk return trade off for green and brown equities that that Patrick's done uh, so much interesting work on. Um, so that's a topic to um, uh, in, in finance this allocation of funds. Um, another topic uh, for future research is is hedging risk. Uh, how can the financial sector best transfer risk climate risks from those to those uh, better suited uh, holding them? So of course climate risk uh, will affect everyone, but it's going to, uh, it's, it's this global risk, but it's also very heterogeneous um, local impacts. So thinking about the insurance pooling of, of heterogeneous climate risk. I think we're still in an early stage of understanding climate risk. Um, one example of this is, is we face a wide range of, of estimates of climate beta positive and negative, and, and we still have to sort through that. Um, uh, in research. Uh, there are also research opportunities in identifying climate risk exposures and investors' preferences with respect to uh, climate risk. Financial markets are able to aggregate information across investors. That's one of their, their key attributes. Uh, but this requires greater disclosure by firms for their exposure to various types of climate risk. Um, so aggregation of information requires some disclosure. Understanding how to measure that exposure is important. Um, and this endeavor also has a very practical implication of, of illuminating the extent to which climate-related uncertainty and risk can pose threats to financial institutions and financial stability. One emerging source of disclosure and information uh, are the climate scenario or stress tests in Europe. And uh, there's another one uh, scheduled next year in the US for six financial institutions. Um, but more work is required to extend the standard risk modeling methodology to account for the long time horizons and deep uncertainty of climate related risks. So organizing those, those climate uh, scenario tests um, 
is still a, an important area. Let me turn to macroeconomics. And of course, one, one research priority is understanding the effects of larger and more frequent physical climate shocks. Fabio's work's an excellent example of that. Uh, Andrew Martinez, who's I think on this uh, call uh, on this video as well, uh, has also got great work in this area um, on cyclones. Uh, if, if, uh, and let me recommend that. Um, Related to that, uh, climate adaptation, I think, is under an under-researched topic. Spending on resilient infrastructure or air conditioners uh, will divert more and more resources from productive capital ac accumulation. Uh, it's got, um, I think, implications for both productivity and for, for price inflation. One particularly important type of economic climate adaptation is human migration internally uh, and across borders. Um, and I think this is um, uh, has also been um, uh, under-researched or, um, I mean, again, uh, this human migration, the climate migration that's coming, that's starting, that has already occurred, um, uh, will have important consequences. It reflects the wide ranging distributional impacts of climate change. Um, and although, you know, concerns about inequality are often ignored in, in macroeconomics, um, and I've certainly been guilty of that myself, um, the climate distributional impacts are so uh, large as to likely force uh, some consideration in, in, in macro uh, modeling, uh, as well as in development and, and in other areas. Climate mitigation and the transition to a low carbon future will also require a reallocation of labor and capital to green sectors. I think that that process is still imperfectly understood. Um, and, you know, we're still trying to sort out the productivity slowdown of the 70s, I think. So um, we are, um, we have got a lot of work uh, to understand uh, this reallocation. Um, just one example, we're going to need more research on how the transition to a low carbon economy will affect the dynamics of price adjustment in the economy in the short and the longer run. Finally, at the macro finance interface, which is where I've done a lot of my work, uh, climate related financial risk also has macro effects. Any climate risk to financial markets, balance sheets, credit availability, financial stability, they will also have effects on the broader economy through, for example, elevated credit spreads, greater precautionary saving, and the extreme of financial crisis. This interface, this, this uh, these climate-related risks and how they're going to affect the macro finance um, uh, aspects of the economy um, are an important area for future research. I could go on, but let me stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. I'm not sure what you left for everyone else, but um, but I'm sure we'll, we'll find something. Uh, Anastasia, would you like to go next? Sure. As you said, I'm not sure what is uh, left uh, to to say at this point, but um, obviously my view on how um, uh, research on climate change mitigation policies has evolved has been shaped by the different uh, webinars that we have organized for the Access Forum the past two and a half, um, two and a half years. And even though um, Glenn was right to say that there has been some type of inertia in terms of uh, research on the subject, uh, um, I found that uh, new ideas, uh, what was considered to be a new idea or a novel criticism in 2020 um, has become mainstream in 2022 with obviously quite a few debates uh, that uh, still remain unsettled. Um, for example, we talked about carbon prices until recently, most research on carbon pricing was uh, focused on the impact on GDP and employment. So. In a 2021 webinar, Elaine Ray, when she discussed uh, the effect of uh, carbon pricing on inflation, she only 
quoted three studies and argued that, that uh, um, thus far the evidence was inconclusive. Um, so she uh, mentioned a um, 2014 study by um, uh, McKibbin, Morris, and Wilcoxon, I think, and it was a model-based study and found, which found uh, that uh, carbon pricing was um, inflationary. The other two studies uh, she mentioned were, were um, more recent ones. They were empirical ones. And one was by uh, Conrad and Di Mauro, who actually thought, found uh, that um, carbon pricing was deflationary. The other study was by uh, Diego Kensing, um, whose um, conclusion was the opposite, uh, that carbon pricing was um, inflationary. But it should be noted that uh, Diego Kensing's um, paper was the first one to address the distributional impact uh, um, of carbon pricing. A lot of research uh, has been published since then, um, looking at the issue in a much more granular way. So um, they are trying, I mean, there has been an effort to differentiate uh, the effect of carbon taxes versus the effect uh, of ETS on uh, inflation. And one such uh, study was presented by Rickley Messner, I'm completely killing her name, uh, at a recent webinar, and she found um, that carbon taxes have no effect on inflation, much unlike uh, ETS that did have uh, a small but persistent effect on inflation. So what I'm trying to say is that already in these two and a half years, we've seen um, an, a significant increase uh, in um, research um, addressing different issues that probably two, two and a half years ago, there wasn't much um, there. For example, take the ESG that um, Glenn mentioned. In 2019, the only, the main actually critique was by Berg, uh, Kölbe, and uh, Rub, um, Rigobon, um, who found that uh, the uh, um, six ESG rating agencies uh, were using significantly different methodologies. And as a result, uh, ESG was not a reliable tool, neither for investors nor for policymakers. Subsequent research uh, even showed that ESG contributed to greenwashing, um, but acknowledging the usefulness of ESG uh, as a tool in the transition to net uh, uh, zero, um, Scatinia and uh, Zuleika, who also presented during one of our webinars, suggested as a remedy a new um, ESG taxonomy that would be comparable across uh, all countries and would somehow um, designate some economic activities as uh, environmentally sustainable. And I think this was an idea that was picked up by the EU um, quite recently. Um, as uh, for unsettled uh, debates, I would mention one. Um, on how we model uh, climate change. Do we model it as a one-time big shock as uh, Mike Barnett assumed in a um, webinar um, in May uh, 2022? Or is it something that um, uh, impacts uh, um, the economy little by little, as uh, it was assumed by Chuck Mansky uh, in a subsequent webinar. Um, all in all, I mean, I think it's a platitude to say that much more work needs to be done, but it's my opinion that this um, um, constant uh, evolution of ideas and uh, recalibrating and refining of, uh, of models uh, enhances uh, the credibility of environmental policies. And that's something that uh, Roland Benabou highlighted in one of our webinars, uh, uh, when he said that um, for these uh, policies to actually work, society needs uh, to be um, on board. So I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. And Pierre. 
Thank you very much. So um, a lot has been said already. I'll, I'll, I will try not to repeat. And let me take a different, um, slightly different angle to to command that. Uh, my my interest in, in, in research on climate mostly came for um, for policy reason. It's to it's to uh, to have policy implemented. And, and as people from this webinar knows, I'm quite obsessed sometimes with, with central bank. So it's it's to see what can central bank do and what are the, the scientific fact or background that they can use. So in discussing what, what can be done in terms of research for the next year, let me just take three decisions that have been taken by central banks or supervisors this year and see what are their implications for, for next year. So let me start with uh, the most recent one. You might have seen that, I think it was last week that the, the banking, uh, the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision uh, published some um, comments on how to integrate climate risk into pillar one. So basically how should uh, banks uh, assess and integrate climate risk in their, in their <clears throat> risk management. And, and they do that, um, by saying that central bank should by that bank should use a conservative approach and despite despite the, the scarcity of data and that banks must uh, scale up rapidly their capacity to do that as as new methodology uh, emerge um, but how can they do that concretely now uh, now that they've been asked to really take into account climate risk? so the, here there is a few challenges how can they calibrate their tool without past data um, how do they deal with the fact that climate risk will come with certainty, but we are quite uncertain about how they will unfold? Um, how do they deal with heterogeneous assessments that uh, Anastasia mentioned about climate risk from, from different uh, providers? Um, how do they deal with the lack of disaggregated data? So I think there is a, a, a need for to, to basically provide banks with concrete methodology and tools. Uh, on how to assess and manage climate risk concretely. And, and that could be um, something that academics can co contribute to. Um, I think central, central bank and supervisor also would need to have tools to, to see, to check that uh, banks integrate, uh, integrate these this, uh, this risks, uh, including reflecting that in terms of capital adequacy. So they also need for, for tools to, to check what's happening in, in the in the, in the banking sector. A so, second theme that has emerged last year, I think uh, also is, is uh, the question of uh, climate risk as a, an emerging and a serious risk for the financial system as a whole, a systemic risk. So the ECB has done some pioneer research this year stating that uh, it's, uh, it's potentially a systemic risk. This has been taken also by the BIS, the IMF, the FSB, who all say that it's climate risk are potential systemic risks. So central banks must know this, this systemic risk better. So far, so far they've done it with stress tests, as it was mentioned by, by Glenn, but uh, the Financial Stability Board and, and, and the NGFS have just published also there the conclusion that stress tests, uh, as we are doing them now, are giving a lower estimation of systemic risk. So it's a lower bar. Uh, so it's kind of an understatement of systemic risk. And what is missing in, in the current methodology are the second run effect, certain price change, internal linkage within the financial sector. So there is a gap in terms of methodology. And uh, I think that's also uh, an avenue that is also an avenue of research about uh, how to assess systemic risk from climate change. And, and as a core, as a corollary, Real that what are what are the best macro potential policies to address uh, this climate risk? Um, I think more re research is warranted there to define a broader macro potential policy for the financial sector, uh, and I think it's also interesting to see to see in, in how financial sector itself contributes to the to future climate risk. Uh, beyond the short-term view, to, to have like a, a long-term view of, of climate systemic risk in the financial sector. The last um, set of um, um, decisions that have been taken by, by central banks, um, it's uh, an example is uh, the integration of climate risk 
in their uh, monetary policy operation. So the ECB has announced that they will um, integrate a better climate risk management and also measure to support the transition in, in, in their corporate asset purchases. Uh, Japan has announced um, that they want to try to support the transition with targeted refinancing operation. Uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore has announced that they are going to integrate climate risk exposure in their foreign exchange reserve management and that they will try to place their portfolio also to try to, to get the benefit of the transition. But you have many small examples. Of, uh, of, of monetary policy that have been adapted to climate issues. So now that we have actually central banks that have started doing something, I think one avenue of research is to um, to see if these policies achieve their goal. Um, do they really decrease the risk exposure in the balance sheet? Do they support the transition? And I think we might have start to, to have kind of um, experimental data to assess that. Uh, just a word to conclude about inflation. That's the elephant in the room. Uh, we see with current inflation that there is a strong uh, link with energy prices and thus also with energy policy and the transition. Um, and I think the, the ACB, for example, is saying that a transition would be a good scenario for them because that would reduce the shocks from, from, from energy prices, for example. And I think in general, more research is, uh, is warranted to see, to compare the different scenarios and, and the consequence for policymakers. Like if we compare a hot house scenario with a, with a transition scenario, which one is better to, in terms of uh, managing, managing inflation in general, in general, which one is better in terms of, of um, so financial stability, what kind of transition is best for central banks to, to navigate that? Uh, how can central bank manage expectation along this transition by, uh, path? And you know, how do central bank coordinate with other authorities for that? So there, I think there is a more broader view about where do we want to be in terms of transition? Uh, what are the consequences if we are not there? And then how do central banks and financial supervisors operate in these two different uh, scenarios. Thank you very much. Um, well, let me, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and, and summarize a few things. I think that there has been quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of uh, food for food for thought. Um, uh, I guess before I do, I'll just say that I had a, a, a few things related to um, related to both what Pierre said, and then what, uh, what Glenn said. So Pierre mentioned um, mentioned two things, and I think that there's been uh, quite a bit of work um, on on these. The first one is on is on climate stress testing. I think we have to understand better how to do climate stress testing. Um, the long horizon the long horizon um, uh, scenarios that people have created, I think, are um, are probably not what we need. That's my instinct, in any case, um, and because I think that financial stability problems occur quickly. And so the question is not so much what the climate transition is gonna create, what the what climate change and the transition and adaptation uh, are going to create slowly, but what would what could happen quickly. Um, and there are sure there are certainly things that can happen that can happen very quickly as people wake up to wake up to risks that they they had uh, had been mispricing, um, and I would point to a paper by uh, Berner, Engel, and Jung on climate stress testing that describes something how to do that, and also is based essentially on uh, Glenn mentioned climate betas. Um, it's sort of ba based on something like a climate uh, like a climate beta. Um, the second point is the is the is the question of what it is that central banks. Uh, central banks can be doing, um, and here I think uh, I think we have to be careful. Um, we have to be careful not because they should be doing nothing, but because we have to make sure that what they do isn't counterproductive. And I think that that Pierre was was very clear about that. 
um, you you do have to be clear that when you start to when you start to subsidize certain things relative to others, uh, that this can have uh, if you're not careful, it can have perverse it can have perverse effects. It also becomes very politically loaded. Um, so different jurisdictions are going to have different abilities or willingness uh, to to do the sorts of things that uh, that that you mentioned. Um, and then finally, let me let me just turn to um, let me turn to what I think is is probably the the biggest issue going forward, and that is how is we need to think about climate in 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 the context of uh, of other things that are much more pressing on people's lives. Um, we think of climate as being extremely important, but uh, but the problem is that that you look and you say, well, what are the macroeconomic what are the adverse macroeconomic shocks that people are facing right now? And the answer is that there are heightened security concerns, there are supply chain problems with supply chain resilience, there are issues associated with both capital, the flow of capital and people across borders. Those are more immediate problems that people see in their lives. And so the question for the question for for it seems to me for a lot of the um, the academic world is how to convince the political world and people at large that they need to worry about this uh, as, at least as much as they as they worry about as they worry about all of those all those other things and they're going to worry about them in the context of something that is going to not necessarily uh, improve their improve productivity and welfare in the short term. And that brings up, I think, another thing that that was, I think, that was at least at the background of some of the things that, Glenn, that you mentioned, and that is the distributional impact of the uh, of climate around the world and uh, and the problem that we can't, we have to figure out how it is that the advanced world can help the developed and frontier world to adapt and um, and uh, and mitigate climate without forsaking their development, at least not in the longer term. Um, as I think I've, I th as I think I, as I think about it, the answer for climate to the developing world cannot be that they can't develop. Um, that can't be. That cannot be the answer. So how is it that we're going to? How is it that we're going to help? going to help them. Um, I don't know that there, if there are any questions from the audience, I think we're, we're more than happy to, uh, we're more than happy to take them. Um, I'm also happy to uh, give another round. Um, if you'd like to react to what some of the other people said, just a minute or two, um, we can start with you again, Filippo, if you, if there's some things that people, other people said that you'd like to react to, please, uh, please, please feel free. Oh, and I might have a question. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so, so yes, actually, um, <clears throat> I, I want to react to to what has been said regarding uh, actually the, the the role of firms and uh, and the role of uh, um, the role of finance and the financial institution to actually price climate risks and uh, provide a hedge against future risk of climate change. Um, the Bank of Italy is, um, so I want to showcase a little bit something that we are doing at the Bank of Italy. Um, <clears throat> from a couple of years, actually, we have started many projects that relate to the effect of climate change on the productive system of Italy, and also uh, some projects that actually explore the multifaceted characteristics of the ESG ratings and of the financial flows of investors in uh, related to uh, affected countries uh, from local disasters and, uh, and policy. And, and what we are doing now is actually um, is putting together this research and uh, analyzing what are actually taking this question together and making a new research stream uh, internal research stream of climate change, uh, um, <clears throat> fixing the priority for the next years. So what we have done so far is actually pulling together all the projects that we have uh, in all the research department and make it as a, uh, as a, a new strategic line for the, for the research in, yeah. at the Bank of Italy. So the Bank of Italy is taking it very seriously. And 
So we hope to contribute to answer some of these questions, not, not just related to mitigation policies, but also on the role of the financial markets and also on the interaction with the macroeconomic at large. That is what has been uh, <clears throat> has been uh, has been treated in your intervention in the in the next in the next year in the next couple of years. Uh, actually, I. Um, I found your uh, your remarks, Steve, very useful regarding the fact that uh, uh, we must convince actually the um, uh, uh, so the authorities and governments that climate change can be uh, a pressing issue, and also it can be for some reason at the same level of other issue that that seem to be more uh, um, actual for uh, for people and firms. So it's important to me uh, also to find case studies that are representative of the fact that in some cases uh, uh, climate events or climate policies uh, have shaped uh, in a significant way the behavior of firms and households in this way and also of banks so in order to uh, to understand actually what are the immediate consequences of climate change and what can be the consequence the consequence if some specific events occur in in, in some places and regarding actually the the, the, the distributional impacts, what, what I think is not really understood is also there can be a distribution effects also within country, as Glenn was, was mentioning, not just across countries. So this can create also um, some, um, <clears throat> some, some, re, some, e some internal issues that can be, that can be considered, that can be other adverse effects for, uh, for the productive sector in a single country for the demography of firms in a single country, you can have uh, uh, firm uh, di uh, different impacts on firm entry and exit in different places. So the, um, the, the effects of, uh, of policies and climate change on the distribution, that it was, it, it, it was uh, uh, what has been pioneered in, uh, from an empirical point of view in the work of Diego Gensig is something that deserves more more research, I guess. Thanks. Um, I fear we're running a little bit short on time. We had a question though, which was uh, which I will read, and then maybe we'll go to Glenn and 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 Anastasia and Pierre for quick reactions to everything. Um, it seems like a financial disruption is needed for long-term economic stability because maintaining the status quo is going to worsen instability says uh, Jenny Stevens. Uh, what are the leverage points and opportunities for large transformative change in the financial system? Uh, I have no idea, um, but maybe Glenn does. That's a big question. I, I take it then that, I mean, there is the view that if you stabilize something too much that uh, indeed, uh, um, things tend to, uh, there's maybe perhaps too much risk taking going on and, and people get used to that stabilization. That's a difficult issue that central banks have, have sort of just started to grapple with. Um, Filippo's points uh, uh, were, were great. Um, and uh, uh, again, this, this internal, uh, I mean, Climate has such heterogeneous effects, and that's where we need the granularity of data um, for banks and, and to make decisions uh, within countries, within communities, uh, you know, even within a neighborhood, there can be very different effects. And of course, across a, a course across countries. Um, Steve talked about, you know, how can we make sure, how can we bring climate uh, to the table given so many other competing concerns? And you know, I think of climate as exacerbating those competing concerns, often in 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 perhaps more subtle ways. I mean, worries about migration. Um, I mean, that migration is in is to a large extent, to some extent, driven by climate. Um, you know, you've got the climate shocks, you've got the migration, and then it shows up in in a in a, a rise of, of political polarization. Um, uh, I mean, it's just going to exacerbate everything. You worry about biodiversity. Well, climate uh, is is uh, at, at the source of that. Um, so I think, and, and finally, in terms of scenario analysis or stress tests, you know, there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to be done on on plain vanilla stress tests, non-climate stress tests as well. Uh, the Bank of England, of course, just a couple of years ago, did a stress test, as, as Steve, I'm sure, knows. 
on on pension funds and the gilt market and it that you know they they took a one what they thought of as a one in 1000 shock um and uh the market did fine uh and of course uh so either their probability distribution of shocks uh was off or the mechanism uh was off so um i don't think that's a reason not to do climate stress tests or non-climate stress tests or scenario uh, analysis um it just uh you know you've got to be uh, a little humble about about that i just want to say i'm a huge fan of stress tests but uh, uh anastasia on the subject of stress test again from the point of view of what we've done when pierre and i started this uh, um, this webinar series, we had um, uh, we had lectures on the um, stress test that was just completed both by the Central Bank of France and and of ECB. And I think um, it was interesting to see that when two years ago the stress test, the way they were being um, conducted, they were, an end-all and be-all um, sort of tool for assessing um, the risks associated with uh, um, with climate change. Uh, fast forward a couple of, uh, of years, uh, um, I, we had a panel discussion only recently on stress test, where we sort of discovered, much like you were saying, Steve, that the scenarios that were being used uh, we're not actually testing for an abrupt uh, um, uh, reduction in, in asset prices. And, uh, um, and as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, central banker from the Bank of England, uh, she um, emphasized uh, the idea that uh, this was an exploratory exercise uh, for them. Um, so it, was, it, it is interesting to see how things are 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 evolving, and how much more work needs to be done, certainly on uh, on uh, on stress testing. Thank you. Um, we have another comment from James Carroll that reads: the NGFS scenarios depend on one variable, the carbon price. Twenty twenty two has shown that the effects of high energy prices um, and um, has shown the effects of these. Uh, financial sector and technology adapters' decisions will only align with future welfare through higher carbon price expectations today. Surely our job as economists is to get this message through to the public and political system, quantify the negative distributional effects so that there are heterogeneous supports, and to bring this to the international climate negotiations table. Um, I, 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 I mean, I. All I can say is I agree with the comment, but I also agree with Glenn's comment from before, which is that in, there are parts of the world where getting climate, getting carbon taxes implemented is um, is is just simply not going to is is not in the cards. So, um, uh, Pierre, would you like to have a a comment, and then we'll close. Well, this may be for to to link uh, the, the the question about carbon prices and the question about. Uh, disruptive policies to for the transition. I think um, we, we don't want something disrupt, disruptive. Um, I mean, all scenarios show that the best way uh, for financial stability is to have a, uh, like um, orderly transition, not the disruptive transition, but this transition must start early. Uh, so, so we need to have a transition to our financial stability and we need to have an orderly transition uh, that starts very soon. And of course, carbon prices is, is one is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a must. As an economist, that's the first solution you think to. Now, in real world, I, I don't think that one carbon tax can, can change everything or one tax can change everything. In real world, we need an alignment of, of all policies, a package of policies uh, that, that are pulling in the same, in the same direction. And that's where I see the, the role for central bank and financial supervisors supervisors is to be part of this package of policies which can include carbon tax but which also have to have to to be uh, reflected in in monetary policy in financial regulation and it's only when we have this coherent package um, that we we're gonna get uh, 
uh, like a, a orderly transition and, and, a, and a soon enough transition. So we're not asking central bank to replace carbon tax and save the world. We're just kind of trying to do, to to say that um, it's it's all policy policy field that must be that must point to to a direction which is which is the best for 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 all of us. And, uh, and I think if if we have this clarity as well, uh, then and if we think about in that and also in terms of just transition. I think the support for 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 carbon tax and and, and measure that that at the end increase uh, social welfare, the support will be will be probably higher and stronger. Thank you very much, and thank you all. And for the for those of you that are remaining as attendees and listening to us, thank you very much for uh, for participating. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the uh, e access uh, seminar series in the in the coming months and year. Um, so thank you all. And uh, I wish you all a good, good afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Okay. And congratulations Bye -bye. to Filippo. And thank congratulations to Filippo. Yes, congratulations, Filippo. <laughs> <laughs>